It's 1971. A guy named Russ Collins in Southern California built something nobody thought was possible. A motorcycle powered by a Honda four-cylinder engine, 400 horsepower, weighing just 360 pounds, running fuel injection, and a supercharger. He called it the Assassin. Now here's where it gets interesting. Racing authorities didn't know whether to celebrate it or ban it, because this wasn't just another speed machine. This was the first time any Anyone proved that Japanese precision engineering could marry American horsepower in a way that changed racing forever. By 1973, racers were so desperate to beat the assassin that they were literally stacking three engines together on a motorcycle. Three Nortons, three Triumphs, three Harley Davidsons, anything to match what one Honda could do. This is the story of how Japanese engineering philosophy didn't just compete with American drag racing. It fundamentally challenged everything Americans thought they knew about power and speed, and nobody talks about it. To understand this story, you have to understand two completely different approaches to engineering. American drag racing in the 1950s and 60s was built on a philosophy we can call brute force. More displacement, more fuel, bigger carburetors, massive horsepower. The thinking was simple. If you want to go faster, add more power. And it worked. Don Gar the Ram Chargers. These American teams were creating absolute monsters, but they were also dealing with reliability problems, inconsistency, and engines that would destroy themselves under the stress of racing. Japanese manufacturers, Kawasaki, Honda, Suzuki, they came from a completely different world. Japan had limited resources limited space. They couldn't waste materials, so their approach was different. They believed in precision, efficiency, and making every single component work perfectly together. The Kawasaki Z1, introduced in September 1972, is the perfect example. On paper, it shouldn't compete with American big blocks. It's a 900cc four-cylinder engine, which would be tiny in drag racing terms. But Kawasaki engineered every component to tolerances American manufacturers didn't even bother with. Six months after the Z1 was introduced, in March 1973, Kawasaki rolled three Z1s into Daytona International Speedway with a mission, break world records. And they did it spectacularly. One Z1, tuned by the legendary Japanese shop Yoshimura, set a one-lap speed record of 160.288 miles per hour with rider Yvonne Duhamel at the controls. 160 miles per hour on a motorcycle in 1973. That was unheard of. Two other stock Z1s set up closer to showroom condition assaulted the 24-hour endurance record. They covered 2,631 miles over 24 hours at an average speed of 109.64 miles per hour, setting a new world record. In total, Kawasaki set 52 FIM and AMA records in those three days at Daytona. And here's what's crucial to understand. This wasn't raw power. This was engineering efficiency. When Russ Collins built the Assassin in 1971, he understood something nobody in American drag racing wanted to admit. Japanese precision could create efficiency gains that brute force could couldn't match. The Assassin's Honda engine was bored and stroked, but the real magic wasn't in displacement. It was in the fuel injection system something American carburetors couldn't compete with. Fuel injection meant precision fuel metering that remained consistent lap after lap. It meant reliability when carburetors were dumping fuel unpredictably. The supercharger Russ added? That wasn't new, but the engineering around it, the precision of the boost control, the way it was integrated with the fuel injection, that was revolutionary. This wasn't just more power, this was engineered power. RC fuel injection. That's Russ Collins' company, built the Assassin, and it immediately started winning. And I mean immediately, not just winning, but dominating drag racing at a level nobody had seen before. Here's what made it revolutionary. First, it weighed 360 pounds. Most American drag bikes were pushing 400, 500 pounds. That might not sound like much, but weight to power ratio is everything in drag racing. Second, the fuel injection. Remember, this was 1970.
1971, most American drag racers were still using multiple carburetors stacked on top of each other, trying to feed massive engines. The Assassin had two Weber carburetors initially, a dual Weber setup, which was revolutionary. Later, it switched to fuel injection. Third, the reliability. This is the part that American racers didn't want to admit. The Assassin would run consistent passes. It wouldn't destroy itself. The engine stayed together. Compare that to American motors that would literally disintegrate under the stress of nitromethane. Fourth, this was the first Japanese motorcycle to use magneto ignition in drag racing. Precision ignition timing was not something American drag bikes were prioritizing. But here's the thing. The Assassin didn't run on gasoline. Russ pushed it further. It was the first Japanese motorcycle to run on alcohol and nitromethane fuels. And it worked. It remained consistent even on the most exotic fuels. Racing authorities were baffled. Here was the small Japanese engine from Honda, a motorcycle engine not even purpose-built for drag racing, and it was outperforming massive American V8s and purpose-built racing engines. Let's Let's talk about what made Japanese precision different. American drag racing in 1971 was obsessed with displacement. If you wanted more power, you bored out your engine. Ford had the 427 in drag cars. Chrysler had the 426 Hemi. Chevy had big blocks. The thinking was, displacement equals power. But Russ Collins took a Honda 750 four-cylinder engine a touring motorcycle engine, and through precision engineering, boring, stroking, supercharging, and fuel injection, extracted 400 horsepower. Let that sink in for a moment. A Honda 750 that came from the factory producing maybe 80 horsepower became a 400 horsepower racing machine. That's a five times power increase, not through brute force, not through displacement, through precision engineering. For comparison, a typical American big block drag racing engine in 1971 might produce maybe 600 horsepower from 427 cubic inches. That's about 1.4 horsepower per cubic inch. The Kawasaki Z1 street bike stock produced 900 cc's worth of about 82 horsepower, or about 0.09 HP per cubic inch. But when precision tuning was applied, when Japanese engineering philosophy met racing application, everything changed. The difference wasn't in raw displacement. It was in how every component worked perfectly. Precision tolerances meant less friction. Fuel injection meant perfect fuel atomization at all RPM levels. Precise ignition timing meant combustion happened exactly when it should. This wasn't mystical. This was engineering philosophy. Japanese manufacturers had learned this in the precision tool business. When you're building machine tools, tolerances matter. A tenth of a millimeter matters. That philosophy carried over to engine building. American manufacturers had learned their philosophy in the muscle car business. Bigger was better. More was better. Precision was nice, but not necessary if you had enough displacement and fuel. The Assassin proved those assumptions wrong. By 1973, racing teams realized they couldn't beat the Assassin, so they didn't try to match it. They tried to out-weird it. This is where it gets absolutely wild. Racing teams started building multi-engine motorcycles. Not to have more power, they wanted more engines than the Assassin had. If one Honda four-cylinder was beating everything, maybe two or three engines would work. Russ Collins responded by building the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe, a motorcycle with three Honda engines, three four-cylinders, meaning 12 cylinders total, running on nitromethane. This thing became the first seven-second motorcycle in drag racing history. Best time, 7.80 seconds at 179.5 miles per hour. Let that sink in. 1973, a motorcycle with three Honda engines hitting seven-second quarter miles. In the same era, top fuel dragsters were running sixes. The motorcycle culture in America had never seen anything like this. But here's what's crucial. The multi-engine bikes were the response to the Assassin. They weren't better. They were more desperate, bigger, heavier, more complicated. But they worked because they had more engines, not because they had better engineering. And even then, it took three Honda engines to match what European bikes with massive displacement 
attachments couldn't do with single engines. By the mid-1970s, Japanese motorcycles had completely transformed American drag racing culture. The Kawasaki Z1 drag bikes became standard in racing. This wasn't just performance advantage, this was philosophical revolution. American drag racing was built on more. Japanese engineering said better, and better won. What Russ Collins and the Japanese motorcycle industry proved in the early 1970s had ripple effects for decades. By the 1980s, Japanese precision engineering had penetrated every aspect of American racing. Import drag racing, Honda, Nissan, Mazda, Toyota, became a genuine force. Teams were using Japanese engines and building dragsters around them. But more importantly, this philosophical shift affected how American racers thought about engine building. The old build a big engine approach gradually gave way to engineer it right approach. You see this in fuel injection adoption. American drag racing resisted fuel injection for years, partially because it was expensive, partially because they didn't believe in it. Japanese racers had no such resistance. They embraced it. By the 1990s, fuel injection was becoming standard in drag racing. Why? Because it worked. The Japanese had proven it. In the late 1980s and early 1990s, Japanese tuner culture exploded in America, especially in California. Kids were taking Honda Civics, Nissan 240SXs, and building drag cars from them. The engineering philosophy was pure Japanese. Precision, efficiency, and making every component work perfectly. The irony is that Americans invented drag racing, but Japanese engineers showed them a better way to do it. The Z1 drag bikes never stopped being raced. Even today, you see original 1973 Z1 drag bikes competing against modern machines, and they're still fast because the engineering philosophy was that good. Modern drag racers will tell you, if you see a 1973 Kawasaki Z1 on the line, respect it. These bikes were engineered engineered better than machines twice their age in some cases. The Japanese Precision Meets American Power story isn't just about drag racing. It's about innovation through constraint. Japan didn't have unlimited resources in the 1960s and 70s. They couldn't build massive V16 engines like some American racers. So, they engineered smarter. It's about philosophy. Two different ways of thinking about engineering collided, and the more efficient approach won. It's about cultural humility. American drag racing had to admit that a precision approach could beat brute force. That's hard to admit when you invented the sport. And it's about how innovation does doesn't always come from the market leader. Japanese motorcycle companies weren't trying to beat American drag racers. They were just building motorcycles well. American racers then applied that engineering philosophy to drag racing. The multi-engine drag bikes, they were a desperate response, but they led to incredible machines. The Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe running on nitromethane pushing physics to the edge. That wouldn't have happened without the philosophical challenge the assassin created. Innovation creates counter-innovation. Challenge creates response. And sometimes the response becomes more legendary than the original challenge. The Z1 drag bikes are 50 years old now. They still compete. They're still fast. Why? Because they were engineered with precision that has held up for decades. That's the lasting impact of Japanese precision meeting American power. It taught American racers that engineering beats displacement, that precision beats brute force, and that understanding how every component works together beats just making things bigger. Here's what I think is remarkable about this story. Nobody planned this revolution. Russ Collins didn't set out to challenge American drag racing philosophy. He just built a better machine, using the tools and knowledge available to him. The Japanese motorcycle companies didn't realize they would transform American drag racing culture. They were just building precision motorcycles. But when precision met American drag racing, everything changed. We talk about legends in drag racing. Don Garlitz, the Ram Chargers, these incredible American racers, and they deserve that respect. But the Assassin and the Japanese motorcycle revolution, that's a legend too. A legend that showed us all how to think differently about engineering. That's worth remembering. Thanks for watching.